I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the founder of the church I served as a bishop. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many others have made a similar journey into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about, people who want to share their story. So if you're a Latter-day Saint seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you joining with us today. Um, you know, one of the things that's been most interesting to me as I have come out of Mormonism into Christianity is the number of people that are here in the state of Utah and probably around the country, but that have a great love for the Mormons, even though they were never Mormon. And I could name a, a dozen people that I'm aware of, pastors and other people who donate their time and, and their resources and everything to uh, share what we call the good news with, with Mormons. And so it's my real pleasure today to introduce to you one of, one, I think one of the best, uh, is Aaron Shafawalaf, Shef and I appreciate you coming. <laughs> Got the name right. Yeah, and appreciate you coming and sharing. Appreciate We're going to be with him now for a couple of weeks here, and so we, I'm just really thrilled that you'd be willing to Thanks. come and share. Appreciate it. Now, you were never Mormon, but got pretty close. We'll hear about your story mm -hmm. uh, down the road there. So where were you born, and give us a little bit of your background. So born in Colorado Springs. My father was in the Air Force, so we bounced around the country from there to Montgomery, Alabama, Dayton, oh. Ohio, Tacoma, Washington, Dayton, <laughs> Fairfax, Virginia, and back to Dayton, Ohio. Oh, wow. So. Now, the Air Force Academy's in Colorado Springs, yes. right? Yeah. Yes, sir. So was My he father was there. Yeah. <laughs> was he, oh, he was there in school? Yes. Oh, uh, well, no, no, he was, see, he was there for officer training. I, I don't oh. remember. I, but anyway. Yeah. A lot of travel, a lot of Air Force. Uh, he wasn't there as a student. No. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So in your midst of travel, now, were, the, were they, what religion were your parents? And um, My mother and father uh, were believers and brought us to different Christian churches around the United States. Yeah. I don't remember any denominational identification or oh, okay. uh, yeah. you know, tribal identity, whatever, <laughs> but uh, we just went to different Christian churches and so... So you yeah. feel like you had a Christian background or Oh, yeah. Upbringing? They brought us to churches where they had something called a wana, where they oh, yeah. teach the, the kids to yeah. memorize passages and make it fun for them. And so a lot of seeds were planted. Yeah. And I can only imagine how many sermons were preached at me that <laughs> had the Word of God that I wasn't listening to. But yeah. Well, as a young kid. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you now do a wana, though they have Red Course Sunday and Sunday school for young kids young people, any other classes that they hold? And, a lot of it was like a Wednesday and night in the camp thing, I think. Oh, is it? Yeah. Every Wednesday. And then you have summer camps and stuff. Yeah. Did you go to those? I, I went to one. It was like the Iwana Scholarship Camp. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah. It was good. God was good to me. Yeah. Good, and so, good seeds planted. You know, I guess maybe from the, your perspective, I know sometimes we talk to the LDS people, and, and I think there's some question about how deep their understanding is of of anything really, the religion itself. Do you feel like you had a, a basic knowledge of the Bible and Jesus? At this a lot point? of surface level stuff, but yeah. I think that is, was just a part of the stage of learning yeah. for me. I also think that I grew up in an era where a lot of the um, preaching was ex exclusively topical, whereas a lot of the oh, well, yeah. more churches today are going through books of the Bible and they're preaching. Uh, sermon verse, series. More verse by verse. Yeah, and so yeah. get more, a better like overview of the biblical content. Mm. Yeah. So. But I really do think a lot of people get saved by learning small Bible verses <laughs> and the Word of God. It's like opening a door um, that you know, where the room's really dark and, and and there's a lot of light behind the door and someone just cracks open the door and the light <laughs> just floods, floods in. Yeah. And so I, I didn't, you know, people say, um, have you read the Book of Mormon from cover to cover? And it's just a strange question because... <laughs> The Bible shines through that door um, often when someone's not even sincerely yeah. interested in it and they just read a little bit of it. So, but yeah, I, it, really, it really was later in life where 
uh, things started. Biblical literacy started to increase became substantially. More yeah. So you went to the school where then? Say middle school and high school? I went to a, a high school in Dayton, Ohio, and, I, and then for, uh, well, firstly in Fairfax, Virginia, and then it finished high school in Dayton, Ohio. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, let's see. I know you've got uh, whole different aspects to your story. I've listened to a couple of your interviews that you, you've done elsewhere, and, and just fascinating. So uh, tell us maybe the first experience you remember as a young man. I, I think that um, my youth was a series of awakenings to something inside of me and something outside of me. Oh. And uh, part, part of that was music. And music kind of, te- kind of tweaks your being where you start realizing that you're a soulish creature because it really captures you and just oh and music has this incredible effect and i was enthralled by it and um and then now you you played what uh oh i you played play? violin but I mean, this is really just listening to music oh, listening, and, yeah. and then um i reading c.s lewis uh before i went out to fairfax virginia i read a book called mere christianity and lewis introduced me to some very simple basics of Christianity. One of the ideas was that we live in a very moral universe where there's good and evil and we already live in a, in a purpose pregnant, you know, reality. I like to say we're already living in Narnia. This, the joke's on us. This is <laughs> this is a pretty fantastic place we already live in. And he wrote Narnia, of course. Yeah. 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 And, and Lewis it, it was like, you know, if there's no God, um, why do we have this unshakable sense of right and wrong, of, of objectively good and objectively evil yeah. things about life. And that stuck with me. And um, and then just the simplicity of the gospel. But uh, one of the other awakenings was when I moved from Fairfax, Virginia to Dayton, Ohio, um, I had my first girlfriend. And to that was a huge awakening because you start, you know, attaching yourself to someone and having a bond and, and there's romance that and then, you know, there's like a sexual awakening where you start, you know, as a young boy. This is in high school. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Middle yeah. school and high school. Yeah. Um, but the, the, you know, moving, I, I think I moved to Dayton at my beginning of 10th grade or maybe the end of 9th grade. Okay. Um, but uh, I start realizing that I'm, I'm, I'm more than just an animal. I'm, I'm a soul, souled creature. And um, I was made for something great. And, but it's also a series of failures with the every awakening, there was an associated failure in my life to to redirect that to God's glory, to uh, do what I was made for, to be in relationship with God, to obey and love Him and trust Him. You really sense this as a 16, 17 year old? I can articulate it better now. Sure. But back then it those was still being those same genuinely feelings. experienced. Wow. And uh, so the uniqueness of this situation, why I'm even here uh, providentially, is uh, that girlfriend was LDS was Mormon, and um, <laughs> I started getting, I didn't know anything about. Her parents were Mormon? Oh, yeah, their whole family, oh, except her dad was. And, um, I, so I started investigating Mormonism, and I ended up wanting it to be true. I, want, I ended up almost joining. I was sort of in the direction of that. Well, and, she was encouraging you to yeah. learn about the church? Yeah. Did she ever give you a Off book of Mormon or anything? Oh, yeah. She gave me a <laughs> book of Mormon, and uh, I, I just started doing deep dives into Mormonism, yeah. and it was super interesting. I, not ha- having joined yet, I started appropriating or adopting the worldview in part. And it. Uh, what it, do you mean by the worldview? The, I, the I really like the idea of the preexistence. I, I really like the idea that uh, of a humanized God, um, n- not that God became a man, but that God Himself, even before coming to Earth, was well, was once was of the human species. There's no deity humanity. Uh, distinction. You once used the phrase human cosmos. Oh. Uh, we're the centerpiece. I liked. I, and that really struck me when, when you said that. So. Mormonism is very attractive to people who want to sort of make God and life a manageable. Like we, we want to project ourselves onto it. And so instead of God being God, Mormonism presents God as a kind of cosmic patriarch over a exactly. corner of the universe, there's like a family tree of the cosmic patriarchs, yeah, and, he's a, he, and he's over one branch, yeah. and so he's sort of a t- cosmic tribal family deity. Um, and it's it's you know I, I ask I ask LDS people if well if you found out that heavenly grandfather had more power, and more knowledge, and more glory than heavenly father, would you stop worshiping heavenly father and start worshiping heavenly grandfather? And they say no, 
And they say the reason why we worship Heavenly Father is that He's our Father. So it really it harkens back to the uh, you know old school polytheism of of a kind of territorial God where you're over a section of of you know the universe of the universe <laughs> or or this earth and you yeah. have a kind of uh, you have a locale where your God and where your family structure your cosmic patriarch is that's over where, you that's where your loyalty is and, and it's not because your God is necessarily the ultimate giver <laughs> and the source of everything good true and beautiful it's just that that one's your God so you know it, rather it's, territorial like yeah say. yeah well, and, I, I, that, I like that though I, I think I, I gravitated my really my, my, my flesh uh, you know scriptures uh, Paul says that uh, there's there's false teachers that are going to come and they're going to, you're going to have passions inside of you and you're going to have itches that you want to scratch that are suitable to those passions. And I think uh, yeah. that was a very romantic worldview to me. It humanized everything, sort of brought it down. And it was romantic to me because it made humanity the center of existence. Yeah, I just had never really thought that before when, when I heard that. It's just amazing, that perspective. And Joseph Smith was, uh, was uh, enthralling. He's larger than life. He draws oh, you, you sense, in. You sense that with the, oh, he's the first vision and all that yeah. stuff. And yeah, and so it's, it's kind of like the lottery. You want it to be true. <laughs> it, you know, you, it's not about it probably being true. It's about, well, it's possible. It, it's worth entertaining. If there's to you a chance. <laughs> because it seems so cool that Joseph Smith would have been a prophet because he tells this great, great big story and, you, and it kind of draws you in. And I do, do think Mormonism is large. It centers around Joseph Smith. I, yeah. I really do think that. And I was... A part of that uh, sentimentalism, though, I, not as a member, not as a, a Mormon, but as somebody who was sort of one foot in, kind yeah. of a flirting with Mormonism. What did your folks yeah. think about that? Or were they um, aware of it? I mean, I guess they knew you were... If for me, it was a dark time of life because I was keeping a lot of what I did in life secret, mm. in the dark, not under the scrutiny of light, not, not exposed to the light. And so uh, when they did find out, you know, at times what I was doing, they, I think they would try to put resources in my path or have me talk to a local pastor. Um, they were very gentle about it. Um, wise? But, were they wise in the way they approached you? Uh, it? They were never, um, uh, they were always kind about it. Um, Good. I, I, I'm not allowed to critique. I, before God, I, I, my, my job is to thank them. Because they they brought me up in the faith, they they made sure I was taught the word. Good. They loved me. They provided for me. They gave me a good foundation. Oh, good. And so that was uh, my teenage mistakes are all on me, <laughs> all on me. Can't blame anybody else. <laughs> so I, I started wanting Mormonism to be true and flirting with it. And do you take missionary lessons? Oh, I talked to the missionaries. Take missionary lessons. Yeah. Talk to them at the library. You have read them the over. Book of Mormon and everything. Huh? Uh yeah yeah I I I, I was doing a deep dive. Um, but I was also a pretty impetuous, uh, lusty, lazy kid that had pretty bad sin Good issues. Good old teenager, huh? Yeah, a fallen human teenager who's awake, you know, who's being awakened to very powerful forces inside of you, and realizing. And I think you know, the, the sin became an inescapable reality to me. It wasn't just a series of acts or choices that I had made. I started realizing, I am bent towards sin. I'm, I'm a sinner by nature. I, I, I you know, I, I, so I wanted Mormonism to be true and I wanted this relationship to work out and it became an idol to me because it was what I was putting my, it was my God because it was what I put all my hope in. I couldn't see a future of happiness without that. Without the church and without your girlfriend and the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, that was really it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, did, I did not trust God to provide everything that would Satisfy my most deepest longings for a happy future in knowing Him and, and benefiting from His That sounds promises. very spiritually mature. Do you, did you sense that you were on this journey back then? I'm articulating it with hindsight now. So much better now. Oh, so. yeah. When my girlfriend broke up with me, it was like my God was... My, 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 my Dagon <gasps> fell down. And it was like my God was, was gone and had abandoned me. Um, you know, it's a very teenage drama. We yeah. laugh at it. No, but it was very serious. That was my sure, world back then. Sure, sure. But God used... I, I, I think I'm a pretty existential person. I, I'd like to think big. But um, what God did to me in that season of life is He uh, moved in me to read the New Testament. 
And when I read the New Testament, um, I got exposed in a more substantive and sustained way to the person of Jesus than I had before. Um, I had a lot of seeds planted beforehand, but I was really focusing on the, just the four Gospels and, and, wow. and reading through the rest. Now, yeah. the missionaries didn't encourage you to read the Bible, did they? I don't remember them doing ever doing so. I would. No, I'm not the. I can't Maybe speak for them. here or there. I can't speak for text. them, but I wouldn't think they'd want you to read the Bible. What What prompted you then to start studying the Bible in such depth? Um, I, I was having a spiritual crisis because even after my girlfriend broke up with me, and I, I I wanted Mormonism to be true. I had just you know for but I was also very aware of my own shame and my own guilt, and I had to do something with it. Aware of your sin again. Is yes. Saying, yeah. People have different strategies for shame and guilt. Um, and I, I, it's interesting. I see this through my agnostic and atheist friends even. <laughs> they have to satisfy the whole of shame and guilt. And so a lot of people fill it with a righteous cause or a political impulse <laughs> or uh, being judgmental over some, I don't know. Yeah. There's, uh, people pick something. But um, I think God just made me thirsty for grace and so I started and truth it's very weak though I, I, I I'm very insistent that God did not save me on the basis of a completely pure repentance or a completely sincere because you were pure or perfect he didn't in fact that was your prayer too wasn't it to him well when he moved me to read the New Testament I having morally failed over and over again I, I came to Romans 4 and there's this, these two verses in there that, yeah, read that. God read used that to for conquer me. Verse 4 of chapter 4 says, this is in Romans, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does, verse 5, And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Mm. And this was really good news to me because I experientially knew that working wasn't something that would help me accomplish uh, right standing with God. I and mean, even if God said, I'll do 99% and you do 1%, I'd figure out a way to screw up the screw 1%. Up the 1%. <laughs> and people end up defining that 1% as a long list of things anyway. But That's right. um, I, I couldn't do it. And so when I saw to the one who does not work, it was so stark that it startled me. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I have to, in order to receive this thing you're holding out, you're saying, you'll only give it to me if I stop working for it. And I had been working in so many ways toward it. And so it was like God saying, stop and rest and trust. Trust in me. And that's hard. Yeah. Because I want to do, do, do. And the next verse says, trust him who justifies the ungodly. And that was incredibly good news to me because I'm ungodly. And so the prayer, what it, what it did for me is it opened me up. It gave me a sense of permission to pray to God, uh, and I remember being at the bottom of, of my shower, just crying out to God, uh, God, I need you to forgive me for all of what I've done, all my failures, uh, all my idolatry failures, all my relational failures, my failure to lead in relationships, my failure uh, to ha practice self-control, my failure to love the Lord that my parents introduced me to. And I cried out to him and I said, I, I don't want you to help me. I, I don't want you to assist me or help empower me. Help to me do, be better. <laughs> be better and then somehow then you'll bless and love me. I don't want that. I want you right now, please, to forgive me and go to the bottom of who I am. I don't want you to chip away at who I am with, with respect to forgiveness. I want you to go to the bottom of all of me and just forgive me forgive me completely and accept and adopt me and justify me and include me and then put your arms around me and it was that bankruptcy it was that sense of of, of losing it of, total humility i mean really I, I, i'll even call it humiliation it's just <laughs> hitting rock bottom of of lord i'm I don't, it's like you're a beggar and you, and, you, and you just empty your cup and you say, I've got nothing to offer. Please just help me. And then it was like, for the first time, God said, yes. I mean, in a new way, in a, new way, in a way that he had never really? absolved me before. It was a new, it was, it, was the, it was a definite beginning of a relationship. 
It was a radical experience for me of grace and forgiveness where God gave me the whole, he, he gave me the gift of the Holy Spirit and that Holy Spirit was testifying to me, I am forgiven, I am adopted and loved by God, I'm completely justified. I know you're a sinner and I love you anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm counted godly even though I'm ungodly. And I had some promises from the Word of God that were solid as a rock. And I had a sense of desperation for God. And uh, it was so interesting is that the, the, the logic of the gospel just started infecting me really quickly. That's like amazing. just days after, I'm thinking to myself about my mother, who at the time I was irrationally thinking of her as my uh, enemy, as someone oh. who was difficult, and I hated my Discipline mother as a teenager. And all that stuff. I was just a, I was not thinking clearly about my mother who loved me. And I, I thinking though of her as, as someone who's difficult, I remember thinking, well, if God forgave me, <laughs> when I was unworthy of love and difficult and uh, problematic, I should forgive people who are that way to me. Very enlightening. It was, it was, like, it was just flipped it. it, it was, there's these commands in the New Testament that say, forgive as you've been forgiven. Yeah. And I, I, it's and you pretty interesting. That. You can't obey that. If you refuse to receive the free gift of forgiveness, that's a commandment of God you can't obey. Had you understood the concept of born again? Was that something you remember from your youth? That, yeah. Were you seeking that at all? Conceptually? And, yeah. I, I don't know if I was seeking a born again experience. No. I was seeking the grace of God and I was born again. Yeah. But after that, I, I exploded. And it took me a few years to kind of settle and sift. But um, I, uh, God took who I am and he reoriented it. And he recreated me, and he, uh, he, uh, I, um, I do believe that if Christianity is true, you should throw all of you into it. We should. It's not a just a cultural yeah. expression of, you know, one way to live. It, it. We should throw all of who we are into it. And if there's no God, I, I, I can conversely believe that we should despair with the most. Uh, <laughs> honest of existential atheists yeah. about how life is, is meaningless and full of sorrow With, and without a God. Terrible. But if, 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 so having been saved, um, God took all of this and it was a new awakening and it was, you just saw everything differently. Yeah. yeah. I, and God loved me. And so what was cool, but shortly after I'm in, um, Campus Crusade for Christ. Campus Crusade for Christ. Now this is you after high school and you go into col uh, yeah. go to college and tell us about this camp Campus Crusade for Christ. It's a college group for uh, kids, young yeah. adults, yeah. to do community together and, and listen to the Word of God together. And it's it's pretty gentle. Yeah. Uh, it's it's pretty simple. And I, when I showed up, there were guys there, one in particular, the first day named Ben Douglas, who was. Uh, uh, he wasn't there to impress anyone. He was just there to love on people. And he, he, he saw me, he introduced himself to me, and he began a relationship with me to disciple me and love me. And that was um, mind-blowing to me. And he fed me the Word of God, and he, he taught me how to pray. He taught me how to uh, have Christian compassion on other people. And he genuinely loved me, and he wasn't doing this to be popular and he wasn't doing this to be seen by anybody um just had a love for god and wanted to yeah. share and, and there was a community there of, of I like to say 12 different dimensions of kinds of people that loved each other in the lord not for the sake of diversity but for the sake of unity wow. and uh it was an incredible dis uh it was a contrast to high school yeah I'm and sure. a little click in an affinity group but now i'm with these people that are so different and they're 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 together because they have a shared gospel. And that, to me, was, it livened me up. Uh, to, uh, out of an, I'd in, there was this new community to enjoy. It was like, it was like an incubation period for me as a believer uh, of, of community. And, I, and a lot of the guys that I knew there went on to become missionaries and pastors. Really? And, oh, it was incredible. Uh, uh, incredible it? people. But a lot of them went on summer mission trips. It's kind of a thing with Campus Crusade. They call it crew now. Yeah. 
And uh, my wife... Oh, for short, crew. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, <laughs> crusade has these connotations that yeah. uh, in other countries don't work out as well. But, um, my wife, uh, my now wife, my then girlfriend, uh, who I had met at Campus Crusade, was going to New Zealand for like an eight-week mission trip. Okay. And I was like, I want to I go somewhere. And so I thought, I should go to Utah. And so I found uh, Utah Partnerships for Christ on the Internet. We're going to pick up yeah. that oh, part sorry, of the story. Yeah. No, no, the next time. I wanted to ask you again, going back yeah. to the Mormonism yeah. that you had experienced, how did you relate that to this born-again moment that you had? And had you, you said you kind of felt a, a, an affinity for Mormonism and some of those concepts. Yeah. Was that uh, tough then as you... It took a couple of years, I think, for God to introduce me to who he really is. I think grace is the gateway drug um, where God isn't someone that you can... Um, I hear Jim laughing back there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it shows you that God isn't someone to be bartered with. He owns me, and he's so good at the same time. And so grace just became an addiction for me. I love it. that's That's who God is. And it really opened me up, and I... And I was going to scripture voraciously, and I started realizing that the God of the Bible isn't just a big one of me. He's of a different <laughs> kind of being. He's not just a cosmic patriarch, yeah. tribal deity, yeah. family figure. There is only one God. Oh, and, there's yeah. no one like him. There's incomparable. And that's terrifying to some people because they think, well, if God is who the Bible says he is, he's not good. He's not. But it's the opposite. It's God is. God is every every bit of who the Bible says he is, and the Bible also says he became a man. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Yeah. God, the, He was equal with God, and yet he um, became a servant. And so uh, in college, uh, you know, sort of slowly stripping away this, I think it was a little bit of Mormonism from like a couple years in high school, and it was also some Christian sentimentalism that I kind of grew up with. <laughs> And in college, I'm, I'm starting to get a, a exposure to the Word of God. And the other thing that just blows me away, that just captures me, that I start getting exposed to, is all these verses in the Bible that say that God's doing everything for His own glory. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to yeah, wait and pick that up in our second half. I'm sure glad we're doing a second one. I knew we, you had so much to share. And Aaron's done so much, uh, a lot of... Uh, evangelizing in the state and so we're going to get a chance to hear what what else you've been doing and so thanks for joining us we'll see you next time here on the ex-mormon files <laughs>